Today we're going to be talking about our phones and how this magical little black box in our pockets knows and controls everything that there is to know about us. Let's talk about it. Today we're going to be talking about our phones and all these conspiracies that have been revolving around it. I created this channel with the intent of bringing biblical Christian perspective onto worldly things. And without any further ado, let's jump into it. So I recently came across this uh, video on TikTok how, about how all these conspiracy theories about our phones, right? How it takes pictures from us every five seconds and you can only see these pictures if you have an infrared camera looking. If you look, you can only see these pictures when you're looking through an infrared camera. How the phone itself, it's actually a mark of the beast. How the name Siri backwards is Iris. And I think to me, the two most interesting ones were how the I in iPhone is actually the, actually stands for, for the all seeing eye, which is the Illuminati, the Freemason symbol, which symbolizes knowledge. And it means that the phone hears and sees everything that we do. And I honestly don't, believe in coincidence i think everything is done with the reason i think everything that people create is create it's created with an intent it's very intentional how it's created i created i think it was created with the intent of in a way con not to control i guess to control us but in a way it's it's, it's more like how these how these things work is it, it collects data right so when you get when you download an app and you get that message which is just started recently they ask you now if if they if the app can track your your uh your um your whatever you're doing throughout all the other apps what it's saying is it can it wants to track what you're doing so you can collect information and resell the information to all the other people or, or use the information to show you things that you may be interested in there's a reason why when you see your phone uh, when you're scrolling through social media, your phone, uh, it keeps showing you things that you like, right? You, you're scrolling through social media. All you see is like, if it's something you spend a lot of time looking at it. So let's say it's a short on YouTube. You watch twice and then the next video is going to be something similar to it. And then if you watch that video long enough, the next one is going to be related to it. And then you, pretty soon you're going to only be receiving things that are related to that because it keeps your attention. And they want to retain your attention for as long as they can both with the intent of controlling you to keep you focused on that, but also with the intent of getting information on you to see what you like, see what you don't like, see what they can sell you. This is the reason why you get a lot of those pop-up messages or not pop-up messages, but those advertisement messages, right? Let's say you're scrolling through Facebook or YouTube and you get those advertisers. And it's a lot of times it's something you're either looking at it on another app or on Amazon or something, or, it's something that you scrolling through Facebook and you stopped and you you glanced at it for more than five seconds. It's the it's intentionally made for that. It's made for the intent to to see what you like, to collect data on you. Bill Gates said that um, I recently saw an interview with him and he was talking about how he was lucky that he went to a high school that it ha he had. It, he had internet and computers, I think it was back in like the late, I, I believe it was the late 60s, early 70s, that he went to high school. And he said that computers and internet did not become known for most people until the late, the mid to late 80s. And, but I was so lucky that I had that when I was in high school in the mid, I think it was like late 60s to early 70s or something like that. And he was like, people don't understand. People don't understand this, but internet's been around for a long time. And it was created with an intent. And he said something to the likes of like, it, it's, it was, I, I don't want to misquote him. I don't remember, but it was like, it was made with the, it, it was made like a brain to collect information. And interesting enough, if you look at IBM, IBM was probably like one of the first, like, big computer companies and IBM was actually created in 1911 and 
there was no talk about technology back then, right? There was no talk about computers back then. We've only heard about it in the 80s. Some people like him, they had it in the 70s or 60s. But it was not. This company was created in 1911. 1911, think about that. That was over 100 years ago. And I honestly think everything that's created is created with an intent. It's created with the intention of of doing something, right? And I think most of these things, is, they're created with the intent of, of, of controlling us and they're created with the intent of manipulating how we think, manipulating how we perceive things and how we act. And if you see how TV came about, I saw an interview with Joe Rogan as well, Joe Rogan and this guy named uh, Naval. And this guy's very smart. Uh, I don't agree with a lot of his point of view, but very smart, very eloquent in how he talks. And he talks about how technology is very liberal in itself, meaning that technology, every time he said, that if you look at every time technology gets implemented into society, society gets more liberal. And he's, he's actually a, a Democrat. And I don't, I don't want to get political, but uh, he talks about how the reason why Republicans are losing the fight or this fight or whatever you want to call it is because technology in itself, it's actually very liberal. And I agree. I think I honestly think technology is made for that is made with the intent of making things more liberal, making things more. If you think about this, and this is the one that the, the one that that uh, resonated the most with me. So one of the conspiracies, the, the one, the last one I'm going to talk about is it was how the symbol of the iPhone is actually the forbidden fruit, right? The fruit that was used to be described in the Bible that implemented sin into our lives, which was when Adam and Eve, if you know the story, Adam and Eve ate the fruit, sin was implemented into our lives, was the apple. And then the apple has, and the phone, the apple phone has an apple that has a bite taken out of it, right? And like I said, I, I, don't believe in coincidence. I think everything is made intentionally. And I think I think it was made for that intent. Because if you look at it, it is so easy for it to take you down the wrong path, right? It's so easy for it, for it to control you. Like the way that it, it's made to, to keep and retain your attention, the way that it's made to show you things that you like, things that make you feel good. And these things directly influence you. And, and shape the way you think and act and having that so easy access to these things think about it when i was a teenager it was so hard for you to have access to corn right i say corn like so it, let's say like playboy playboy was so hard to see like i remember like magazine stands had they had they had them in little plastic bags and they had a paper that covered it I remember like video video stores like Blockbuster if if they had like if they had the, the adult section, we couldn't go into the adult section. It used, it used to be blocked off and and there was a curtain and and I remember being a kid we would always try to like take it like get a sneak peek and like take a look at it, right? But it it was hard to have access to these things. And if you look at today, you have access on the palm of your hand or in your pocket at all times. And that, I, I believe that it was made with that intent. It was the intent of making things more accessible. And making things more accessible to an extent is not necessarily always a good thing. And I think that a lot of times, the way we live today and the way things are done today, it's been funneled into our brain to be shaped that way for us to think this way for us to act this way and i think that i think that a lot of times it's made with the intent to to fool us into that these things are normal and these things are okay and these things are oh everyone does it. oh it's so easy because you go on instagram and all you see is like all these like half naked girls and and people doing these things and and like, oh it becomes so normal because the more you consume something you hear a lot of people talking about this and it says it in a lot of books. You are the sum of the five people closest to you, right? Other books say that your environment affects you. The people, the, the, the things that you're around the most and you consume the most, these things affect you. And the Bible tells us that what we see that there are eyes are, are the, are, 
they're the lie to our body, right? That are what we hear and what we consume, it directly affects us. What we say, what we talk, it directly affects our lives. The reason why I say this, the reason why he says these things is because these things have power over us. So we're consuming these things. These things take us into a, into a, into a dark hole. There's a reason why people are so depressed today. There's a reason why people are so anxious today and have so much anxiety and so much, so much the depression going on because people are constantly looking for things lo looking for happiness in the wrong things and uh, i want to share this bible verse with you guys and let me pull it up here all right matthew chapter 6 24 says no one can serve two masters either you hate one and love the other or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other you cannot serve both god and money and the word money here i was I'll say that you can replace that word with anything. So whatever it is that you look for, let's say whatever it is that you're looking for to make you happy, whatever it is that you're looking for to bring you that happiness, to fill that hole that you have inside of you, whatever it is that you're looking for that to, to bring you, to fulfill you, to bring you happiness to like, even you can, you can replace that word with food. You can replace that word with our phones. Oh, I'm going to go eat McDonald's because comfort food, it makes me feel happy. Oh, it's going to make me feel better if I eat McDonald's. Oh, I'm going to go on my phone and scroll through social media. To, I feel depressed. I'm going to go scroll through social media to make, to make me feel better. And all these things. If you, look, if you look for happiness or look for that fulfillment anywhere other than God, that thing becomes your money. And that's where, that's where it says where you can, if you're going to be devoted to one and despise the other. So if you're looking for these things, for happiness, for all these things, for fulfillment in all these other places, except God, that thing is going to become your God. And that's what God means by that. That's what that's what Matthew means right here. And with that said, these things were all created. These are all tools. And it's not saying that money is evil. Money can't be evil because it's just a tool. But if you constantly just pursue money, if you constantly pursue something else, if you're just seeking for that thing, oh, that thing is going to make me happy. Having all this money, having this, it's going to be the thing that gets me there. It's going to be the thing that it brings me happiness. It's going to take this depression and this anxiety away. It's never going to do that. And if you're just constantly doing that, God is not no longer your focus. That becomes your God. And that could be anything. And... With that say, I do. I with that said, I do believe that all these things are made with the intent of, of confusing us, of distracting us, of keeping us, keeping our focus away from God and keeping our focus away from the things that actually matter. And I'll share another Bible verse with you guys. Second Thessalonians two says that don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for the day will come until the rebellion occurs and the men of lawlessness is revealed, the men doomed to destruction. He will oppose. And will exalt himself over everything that is, everything that is called God, or is worshipped. So he set himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. So I believe, with this passage, I believe that everything that is made today, everything that the world has to offer, is made with the intent of confusing us, of fooling us, of keeping us distracted, of seeking into the wrong places seeking happiness fulfillment in any place shape or form that it doesn't come from god that is not god is always going to keep you fooled and i honestly think that this is the direct intent of all this all this technology and i'm not saying technology is actually evil i'm saying that the way we use it, it can make it evil just like the way we use money like the way how he says there, or there's another verse that says that money is the root of all evils because people do anything for money. You can, you can look at it today. You can see like all these people acting the way they act. You can see all these girls doing only fans just to get money. They sell themselves online, expose themselves to the, the, the most sensitive and most intimate parts of themselves online to get money. And that's what it means when it says it becomes your God. Money is your God. You cannot serve two masters.
But if you keep your if you keep your focus on God, if you keep your eye on God, all these other things are just tools, and you can use them. You can use them for good. You can use money for good. You can use money to to bless others that are in need, to bless the ones that are hungry. You can use you can use it for good. It doesn't mean that money is actually the devil or money having money is evil. And with that said, I want to play you guys this video. And uh, I want you guys to let me know um, what you guys think about it in the comments below. And all right, let's get into it. We know that Google is tracking us. We agree to it when we set up our phones. So we wanted to figure out what exactly Google is learning about us throughout the day. So here's what we're going to do. We have two identical phones. The only difference between these two phones is this one is in airplane mode. Both of the phones lack a SIM card and they haven't been set up to access any Wi-Fi networks. By the way, I saw this video on TikTok by this guy, um, Policy Music. You guys go ahead and give him a follow. Check him out. So for all intents and purposes, these phones have no connection to a data network. We're going to keep them with us throughout the day. And while I travel around D.C., we're going to figure out just what Google is finding out about me. Our first stop, Sims Convenience Store, just outside our Fox Bureau, for a quick coffee. From there, we took a walk to the Capitol and took a quick walk around the Senate office buildings and then decided to hop in a car and head around town. Hello. Hey. We're going to the Children's Hospital, please. To run our test, we had to do more than walk the block, so we took a tour around our nation's capital. First, due north to the Children's National Medical Center Hospital, then west to St. Albans School and the National Cathedral. Our tour around town was a 14-mile journey that lasted more than an hour. The entire time, the phones had no access to the Internet. Oh, my goodness. Not a Wi-Fi connection and not any cellular data service. It almost seemed quaint to assume that Google wouldn't even be able to collect data on me. Let's head back to the bureau, my friend. Oh, that church is beautiful. Google's business model is simple. Collect data on its users and then use that data to sell targeted ads. It's a business model called surveillance capitalism. But does that critical data collection work even when your phones aren't connected? So we're back here at our Fox Bureau in D.C., and we've got both of our phones exactly how we left with them. The only difference, really, I snapped a couple of bad selfies at the National Cathedral. <laughs> so cute. But otherwise, they have stayed in my pocket for the entire day. So let's find out what they know. This is our man-in-the-middle device. It's basically a Wi-Fi network that these phones are going to connect to once we turn their Wi-Fi on. It's going to pass data through it on the way to Google, but on the way, we're actually going to get a copy of the same data that Google's going to get. We'll be able to decrypt it and then find out where we've been throughout the day. Within minutes, the numbers rolled in. The phone that wasn't on airplane mode registered more than 100 locations, 130 activities, and even 152 barometric readings. As soon as it hooked up to our Wi-Fi, it transmitted 300 kilobytes of data straight to Google. The phone even logged our exact locations, tracking us all around town, the Capitol, the hospital, the school, and the cathedral. Now, you may notice what's missing here is the exact route that we took, but it got that data, too. It knows when I got out of the car. The metadata has a time log down to the very second, tracking everything when they think that you're walking, riding, and yes, even getting out of the car. Okay, so you're thinking, this isn't a big deal. I'll just put my phone in airplane mode. Yeah, we thought of that, too. This is the other phone that we had with us that no SIM card also remained in airplane mode the entire time. Let's see what kind of data it captured. The phone with airplane mode activated actually logged more locations and activities than the other phone, and it also transferred hundreds of kilobytes of data to Google as soon as it was activated. The only thing that's missing from this map is our stop at the Children's Hospital, but it still knows we were there. There it is. Exiting vehicle, 100% accuracy. Through complicated user agreements and free software, Google gets users to sign away their privacy for nothing. They're even following you in the places that most people would you expect total privacy. Government buildings, a children's hospital, a private school, a church. Every move you make, every step you take, Google is watching you. So yeah, after watching all this, what do you guys think? All those videos starts to make a whole lot more sense, doesn't it? I'll tell you this. They do it. They do. It, they do it for a reason. There, there's a. 
there's a reason why they don't they put those complicated complicated agreements there because they know no one reads it but after watching this would let me know what you guys think about it let me know in the comments below make sure you're liking and follow for more we'll see you on the next one peace